Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Good afternoon to a very beautiful afternoon in San Francisco. I sound wonderful. <laughs> As always. Let's, let's test everybody else's mic. Oh, yeah. hello. Oh, hi. Should we all talk at the same time? <laughs> I think that's easier to figure. All right. yes, hello, that's hello. All right. Got good it. afternoon. Good, after, good afternoon. It's a show on its own right here. <laughs> Testing the mics. Good all right, let's get started. <laughs> Welcome to the Michelle Meow Show, your A through Z, covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. <laughs> uh, we have a special program for you today, a special lunch program. Every Thursday, though, I'm here taping my podcast with my co-host, John Zipper, at the Commonwealth Club. So always, always exciting uh, to be here on Thursdays. I want to give a special, huge thank you to our lunch sponsor today, Ceremony Ford, for providing the awesome sandwiches. Yeah. The Great Leap is running right now at the ACT Geary Street Theater. It's a show written by Bay Area playwright Lauren Yee and follows or centers around Manford, a 17-year-old aspiring basketball player from Chinatown in San Francisco. Saul, a, a coach who coaches for USF, the Dons, and uh, ends up going to China to teach uh, basketball. And also Wen Chan, who is uh, the coach from Beijing, who ends up teaching basketball. And Connie, who's a cousin, or an adopted cousin, of Manford after Manford loses his mother. And so today, our special lunch program, we have 75% of the cast with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cast of four. Uh, I should say the stars. And I'm really, really super excited, starstruck, and um, honored to have them here at the Commonwealth Club. We have Tony Award winning actor B.D. Wong. Yeah. We have actor Ari Gross. You may uh, recognize him from Ellen, and who knows Ellen? <laughs> 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 and Tim Wu, who also has Tim. a. Oh, um, uh, I just lost it right there. Did I say Tim? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, he has an extensive uh, body of work. He's also played in notable roles, uh, Midsummer Night's uh, Dream, Arabian Nights, The Tempest, and a whole long, long, long list. <laughs> really, yeah. you got to see him in action. And so let's welcome our cast. First question goes to BD. Um, mm. Lauren Yee was inspired to write this, this body of work through her father. Her father uh, played pickup basketball in Chinatown. And I read somewhere that your father also uh, played basketball in Chinatown. And as a native of San Francisco, I just wanted to check in with you to see, you know, how important, how, how much of an Im impact does pickup basketball have in San Francisco and Chinatown? Yes, well, what I have learned rehearsing this play at this production in San Francisco is that everyone's father played pickup basketball <laughs> in Chinatown. <laughs> and some, this is something that Lauren says a lot, and she says it with a sense of humor, but it's really true. It really is a very small town, Chinatown, and those of us who have parents or grandparents who grew up or lived in Chinatown they really do all know each other from a certain generation. And the generation kind of, you know, my father, my parents are older than Lauren's parents, but um, I do know a lot of people that played basketball with Lauren's dad, Lauren, uh, Larry Yee, and it's, it's kind of remarkable and, and kind of amazing. Um, my dad was um, luckily a great uh, a, a photography enthusiast, and he loved taking pictures in the 40s and 50s, and to, has, had left, um, has these great scrapbooks of all these great pictures of him and his uh, good friends, buddies, playing basketball in Chinatown. And so we used some of those pictures as kind of inspiration for the spirit of the game in Chinatown, you know, at the very same places where Lauren has written some of the, the, uh, the events of the play. Um, I have a, my own kind of removed uh, version of that. My parents sent me to a youth group at the Chinatown YMCA on Sacramento Street when I was a teenager, and so I played, I was forced to play basketball. <laughs> Theater kid being forced to play basketball. 
And um, so I relate to those locations and that, the, that world in a, in, a, in a way too. It's a wonderful experience to uh, do the play in San Francisco and to feel the audience's reaction to the, uh, pers the immediacy of, of seeing a play set in, in one's own hometown. It's, it's a, a, an experience I really recommend to people who haven't seen the show. You could do this play, and this play has in fact been done all over the country, and it's, it's, um, it doesn't, it's not quite the same. It's always probably good, but it's, there's something a little special about this production because it actually um, it evokes places that everyone knows. Well, I have a question for all three of you, and I can start with Tim and just run right down. Oh. How did you get involved in the play? How did it first get introduced to you, or did you pursue it, or did they pursue you? How did it come up? Um, oh, for me, I, I've actually auditioned for every iteration of this play since the very first time. It, so it started out uh, Denver Center, Seattle. Oh. Uh, then it went to Atlantic. Then they did the Guthrie, and then yeah. this one. And I, I was in callbacks for every single one and never got it. Uh -huh. And the thing is, I met Lauren Yee through the first uh, time I auditioned for it. And credit to her and her being an awesome person, she kept putting my name in for it. So I didn't even um, send my resume for this show here at uh, ACT. Yeah. And I got an email and then from Janet from ACT and she said, would you like to come in and read it? So I was like, all right, fine. I didn't get it the other time. So I'll just go in. And then when I got it, I was like, I went into like panic mode. It's like, you finally, <laughs> I got it. Now what? <laughs> oh, shoot, I didn't think about this two years ago. <laughs> the dog that caught the... the yeah, 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 I caught my tail and I was like, oh, I did it. <laughs> what is my life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that was how I got involved. I, li I like that story because that's very Manford, actually. Yeah. Because Manford doesn't give up. It right. really doesn't yeah. give up until he gets on the team. <laughs> he gets it and he's like, oh, <laughs> now what? <laughs> yeah. Great. Ari. Well, I, I had... Um, a, 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 Gotten a call from my uh, agents in Los Angeles in um, in early December, um, telling me that I'd been offered the role, and um, I, I was delighted. Having worked with BD on a couple of occasions a uh, long time ago, um, and they were wonderful experiences, um, and um, and I had previously done uh, two plays with Lisa Peterson, who directed this production. Okay. Um, uh, both um, uh, uh, both uh, were materials with uh, Asian themes, and um, and I'd also done a play with Pam McKinnon, who's the new artistic director of ACT. So uh, and I loved the play. So it, it was this wonderful gift to have all these elements that were that uh, embodied everything that I wanted to do, the people I wanted to work with. The material I wanted to work on, a, a city that um, uh, where, where I've never lived but have loved all my life. So um, that's how I, I got involved with Great Lake. Beatty? I first read the play in late 2017 because Atlantic Theater uh, in New York was doing a production, the one that Tim's talking about. Mm. And um, uh, I was offered that uh, the part uh, for that production, which was exactly a year ago. And I did that production, and I loved the play so much that when I found out that ACT was doing it, I really wanted to, ho I hoped that they would offer me the part, and they did. Um, I kind of went after it, because I really wanted to have this experience. I was born and raised here, mm -hmm. and so for my mother alone, it was a really great um, <laughs> thing, you know. Seriously, and so I and I had worked at ACT uh, four years ago in a production called The Orphan of Zhao, which was very, uh, really great experience and also great for my mom. So I knew what I was getting <laughs> myself into, um, and I wanted to kind of recreate that that vibe, that family hometown vibe, working on a play that I really liked. Um, so that's how that happened. So question for Ari, um, Saul, he plays this trash talking coach. And this, uh, this American co coach who goes to Beijing, and he teaches Wen Chan, you know, the uh, basketball, but in this way of trash talking. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering how much of a stretch 
was that for you? Um, and, or I guess another way of asking is how much trash talking do you actually do in real life? When she says trash talking, <laughs> she means foul mouth. Oh, okay. <laughs> blue, blue language. Let's get it straight. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, um, Saul has the uh, vocabulary of a particularly dyspeptic stevedore. Mm. <laughs> uh, and um, an extraordinarily foul mouth. Um, uh, one thing I would like to say is that um, it, it, it's kind of pointed out in the play. Um, Saul has this conceit that he's gone and uh, taught basketball uh, uh, to China, uh, when in fact uh, basketball uh, existed in China prior to Saul's arrival. But he does teach um, or attempts to teach um, an aggressive American style of play. Um, and um, I... I'd grown up uh, with a rich vocabulary. <laughs> um, and um, uh, however, I have uh, attempted to um, curb my use of the English language since the birth of my daughter 12 years ago. <laughs> and um, so uh, uh, Saul's salty language is, is something of a joy for me <laughs> to get this kind of release and, and uh, license to... Um, be as foul-mouthed as, as possible. <laughs> um, but it's, I, one thing I would like to add, I, I wound up uh, researching, if you will, trash-talking in mm -hmm. basketball. And, and um, there's another component that uh, Larry Bird mm -hmm. okay. um, is, is, uh, is famous for his trash-talking, but it wasn't so much um, his, his profanity, but his... Uh, his, his, his psychology and his, his unbelievable confidence and arrogance to approach players at the beginning of a game and say, I'm going to get 40 points off of you. Yeah. And then throughout the game would say, 38 left, <laughs> 33 left, until it would drive opponents crazy. And then when he would see them stumble, he would go to the opposing team's bench and say to the coach, can you send out someone who can cover me? <laughs> and, and, and furthermore, would, would, would say to his opponents that the, in the last seconds of a game, all right, look at, uh, I'm going to go stand in that corner and they're going to pass me a ball. I'm going to hit a three at the buzzer. And he would do exactly that, and it would create this tremendous frustration. So that's an element of the trash talking, too. It's not just... Um, foul language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as much fun as that is to get in. Yeah. Tim, well, how much do you like your character? Or not? Oh, I, I, I love any time I get to play someone that's closer to me. There's been like, I, I do a lot of like kind of, sh uh, did at least a lot of like Shakespeare and things like that where yeah. it's kind of like you, d you can be anyone and play these roles. It's not like something where you're thinking. But there's two, actually two or three plays that I've played like Asian American person that I can really relate to. So for for me, like one of the plays was by um, this great playwright uh, Eleanor Burgess, who wrote a show about uh, it was called Start Down, and it was about startups in San Francisco. And I was playing like a, a late twenties Chinese American guy who there was nothing in the script that really required him to be, but she said, no, this is what it is, because it's like this here. Yeah. And then I was able to play Manford, which is, he's a Chinese American from Chinatown kid. So it was like, wow, I don't have to like stretch super far for any of this stuff. It's like, is this what white people feel like all the time? <laughs> <laughs> like, this oh, is what white, like actors white actors feel like? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, and I, I mean, I say that jokingly, but like, if, if. No, you're, it's not you're, a joke. Yeah, no. but it's not a joke at the no. same time. Like, I'm going in and I'm like, look, I can play Sebastian, I can play Demetrius and yeah. all, all these roles, but it's like, that's like, it's, uh, it's you, anyone can. But this is like, this is specifically you. This is kind of how you grew up. This is uh, these struggles of very similar struggles. Like everyone discounts you because you're, you know, from Manford, short guy, loves basketball, and he's Asian. So this is pre Jeremy Lin, pre like, you know, uh, Watanabe and like all these guys coming in now. But it's like 
that, but then you're like, oh, I'm an actor and I'm coming in trying to like do these kind of similar things. And it's like, well, no, you can play these roles and not these. And it's, I mean, like probably BD can, can attest to this. He's been in the business as an Asian kind of the guy. I mean, like I watched these guys like growing up while I'd see them on TV all the time and I'd be like, I get to work with these guys. Yeah. And then like just being able to work with these guys and play this person that I don't have to like stretch like it's not like um it's almost like it's it's like natural this is what yeah of course why isn't this normal you know what would a kind of scottish thing? king think when yeah. he's doing the scene i well speak problem man i have no idea <laughs> of stretches so i guess we we, we shall ask bd <laughs> because um your character i mean the play is set during the chinese cultural revolution and so a few years after um uh Mao's leadership, right? And and so you've been tasked, your character's been tasked by the Communist Party to uh, to lead with with this new cultural revolution and, and basketball and learning how to play basketball. And so you're absorbing and you're learning this from Saul. Sal Mao Saul. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, yeah, there's a lot going on in this play between identities and and finding out, you know, each person's story. And then in your case, it's like you throw in the political stuff from China during a time in which it's really, I think, still very sensitive and hard for, for many of us to talk about leading up to 1989 when you finally have that exhibition game or the, f the friendly game um, and Tiananmen Square, uh, the protests at Tiananmen Square. So all of that makes in, a, your, your character is central to all of that. Yes, <laughs> that's all true. It's a beautifully written play in that it balances a kind of playful sense of humor and a, a kind of sophisticated uh, 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 comedy with a, a really strong emotional center. And the emotional center comes, you know, deepens into the second act and comes with the, uh, the uh, historic events and the, the things, no spoilers and all that stuff. Um, and and so I mean I'm not sure what the question is. That your your stretch fit. I mean and oh my to, stretch to under yes because you talked about you know that's like, very interesting because yeah. as the two of them were talking about their stretch or their lack whatever that they you know, the stretch issue I was thinking it's such an such an interesting question for me because um, th this character is really not anything like me at all I mean I enjoy him because he's very different from me and yet when I'm doing it. I don't feel like it's a stretch. Like I feel like I think what we have to do is kind of try to find the common ground between your emotional life and the character's emotional life, and ride it, you know, through the, the course of the play. And and when you can do that in a well-written play, and it, it feels like it's working, then you kind of start feeling like you're that person. You know, you start feeling like. I have a connection to this person. You find the connection. So I feel like I found that emotional connection that has to do with. For me, it has to do with the, the whole notion of whether or not one follows their dreams or not. And um, in, in the case of the play, there are two characters, Manfred, who really is going for his dreams, and Wen Cheng, whose dreams are kind of suppressed and who's, who's not able to follow his, his bliss, as it were. And in some ways, I kind of relate to Wen Cheng because I am more of a Manfred, and I kind of am moved by Wen Cheng's inability to to follow his dreams. Um, and I also feel, how else do I feel? I feel, uh, I, I relate to Wan Chong, be, um, I don't want to say it without talking too much about the play, but there are personal things about Wan Chong's life that mirror things that happen or are revealed in the play that I relate to in my, role, in my, uh, in my own world. And I have been able to draw on them even though my life is very different from Wan Chong's. So you've been, audiences have been, have been seeing the play. What sort of connection are they making with it? Is, are, you know, you, you were talking about kind of connections you have to it, to the characters and to the storyline, to the place, mm -hmm. the settings. What, do you, what sort of feedback are they? Are they glomming onto the dream of the young player, the, the, the intercultural uh, uh, exchange there, or the, the sport? I mean, what, what are you hearing from that? The, the, you mean the audience? Yeah. Ah. 
I think it's very varied, don't you guys think? Yeah. I do. I mean, I think I'm, it's a very rich play because the, uh, the, the emotional reaction that people have is from different places. Mm -hmm. um, the, the following your dreams or not following your dreams thing is a big emotional um, impact, I think, for the play. People really are very moved by that when it's when when that when that gets when we get into that part of the play yeah but this whole idea that a, a kid uh wants so badly wants something so badly and makes it happen is also a huge part of that what do you guys think well um i i can tell from the first scene of the play that that uh uh manford and saul are in there are several um um san francisco specific uh references <laughs> yeah. and and Yet Every cheers. performance, you can feel um, from the audience that um, that that fizzy kind of yeah. recognition <gasps> yeah. Yeah. of um, whether it's uh, whether it's a school or a place that's named or yeah. you know, et cetera. And um, it's very it's very validating and very yeah. <laughs> it's satisfying as a performer. But I think for the audience, there's a sense of like, oh, that's I know that that's. I've been there, I, I, I went there. I, I don't know, it, there's something very positive about it. I, it is. Yeah, it's like a band coming it's out. It's very exciting. Like, We're in Cleveland. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's that. like that, yeah. But, yeah. but not pandering. It's better than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the opposite. It's them getting it for yeah, themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's great. Uh, I saw the play, and uh, I'm, I'm hearing the hints here, I shouldn't tell you everything that happens in the play, although I really want to. <laughs> but that's my, that's my, that's my promo. Go see the play. It's really good. Uh, but, you know, the reason why I enjoyed the play so much, I was emotionally attached to it, is because I saw myself in Manford, even though, you know, I um, uh, didn't play basketball. I tried. Uh, <laughs> but I loved, you know, all these things that a, an Asian American kid, or, you know, especially second generation and beyond, could connect with with Manford you know you're you're short but you make up for it in your other talents and you know the the persistent drive to create the space for you and then going all the way to China uh, a country in which all you know is that your parents are from yeah um and so I wanted to ask you Tim and in, in how much of if you could expand on that I know you said for you this wasn't really too much of a stretch. It wasn't hard because you identified with with a lot of it. But but this also the conversation around being American and mm. and and then you know knowing that there's a native country that your parents are from and that being a part of your identity. Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of. <sighs> a lot okay uh <laughs> well i, I know mean, it's like yeah so let's talk about identity and <laughs> national you know origin and stuff like that um i think for me growing up i i was lucky to I, i'm from new jersey and i grew up in a place where like um kindergarten my my classmates were vj quatrail amir you know it was like of like a lot of different types of people a lot of immigrants and things like that so and, and i've always grown up with this kind of like uh, you know Asian uh, like Chinese Taiwanese slash whatever kind of community. So growing up, I, I I would I'd never really had the same kinds of uh, uh, identity struggles that I did uh, before I started acting. And then you start realizing you watch like a movie and be like, oh, you're right. There is no one like that. There is no one that looks kind of like me or is... Because the problem being like what I am as a person, I'm like, I am kind of nerdy. I do wear glasses and I do like do like nerdy things. And then when you hear kind of on the internet like, oh, we need these like a a Asian leading guys, crazy rich Asian, look at their abs. It was so cool. I'm like... I don't have those. Um, <laughs> I still am very nerdy. <laughs> like, do I still fit in now in this new, like, all the guys are super sexy, all the ladies are super pretty? It's like, uh, and Tim. Uh, <laughs> what do you do? I will play a 17-year-old. <laughs> um, so there, there's, like, there's a whole kind of, like, minefield out there, and it's not that maybe that it's... It wasn't... Per difficult to find Manford because I identified so much with him, but it was uh, that the challenge of actually de uh, developing and discovering the character was, 
well, uh, I, I, I identify with these parts, but then how do I make him three-dimensional? How do I make someone that wants, that has that drive, uh, not only about having that drive, or else it gets kind of annoying, right? Like, if someone's always like, hey, hey, I'm like the best, man. I'm like the best. I'm the best. I'm, the, I'm like the very best. You get it? I'm the best. It's like, that is not a real person, right? Or, or it could be a real person, but a very boring person. <laughs> So I think the stretch and the identity parts of me was like, okay, I didn't grow up in Chinatown. I know BD did. Uh, uh, they, they luckily housed us near Chinatown, so I was able to walk through and be like, oh, oh. And then we got to uh, hang out at the uh, Betty Ong Center for the basketball jamboree, watching like middle schoolers Chinese, from Chinatown, and I think it was like Presidio Middle School, uh, playing a tournament and then seeing these actual kids. I'm like, oh, this is what it's like here. I go, then I went to a couple of restaurants, went to eat with BD and his mom and his brother and like at like a local spot. And I was like, oh, okay, this is what it's about. And it kind of finding that Chinatown side of it versus the, uh, my parents, my parents came to the States late seventies. So I have that, uh, immigrants background, but what happens when you're a third generation in Chinatown, you know? And that's a completely different thing that some audiences really understand. Like, why can this, uh, this mother character, who's not, who's not in the play, like, why is, it, why is her time in the States so difficult? She's surrounded by Chinese people, right? isn't it? Yeah, but she spoke Mandarin, and they speak Cantonese in Chinatown. That's a big difference. And like, knowing that in my head, versus trying to make sure that the audience gets it. I think that's like these really small cultural tweaks that you have to like, unfortunately be kind of aware of because not everyone has the same experience that I do. Not everyone has the same experience that any of us do, especially in San Francisco. More people are probably more informed about it in San Francisco because it's such an old town. But like when it goes up at the Guthrie, I'm like, I wonder how they would like, yeah. we, we have this question all the time, like at the Guthrie in, in Denver, I mean, even What's in their New reaction? York. In, or even, even in New, New York. York. I mean, it's a smaller Chinatown in New York. Yeah. It's a slightly different. So yeah. it, I think those identity questions are interesting. And I think we might have a slightly easier job here than everywhere else. But still, we, that's like one of those things you have to think about. I, I think the, the, the production benefits greatly from it, for sure. Not bad. only the audience's reaction and the, uh, uh, what the audience is bringing to it, but our ability to access these places. I mean, we went to USF and were coached by the USF basketball coach because we could, yeah. you know, and, and that was just really rare and great from a research perspective. Yeah. Thank you for saying all that. Oh, yeah, exactly that was a lot. I'm I sorry. Wanted, <laughs> no, it, it's, it was exactly what uh, I was thinking in, in this whole thing yeah. of fitting in. And in, in this play, this, this one-pack play, and when you, you know, uh, read the description of it, some people might take away from it that it's about basketball, but it's layered with so many mm. complexities, and some of it is, you know, the, the Asian-American identity and experience of immigrating and being here for generations, and all of that is intertwined into this ball. Ball, basketball, I guess, yeah, for the show, and they do it beautifully, and you have to re kind of read between the lines to really see it all, um, and so it'd be interesting to hear, you know, from Ari, it, just, <laughs> 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 it plays the American, um, right. and, and so some of it, uh, you know, even your line, some of it, you know, c people can take away from it being offensive, or, or uh, there are some stereotypes of, you know, American culture, but you kind of have to hit on that right to for the purpose of the the uh, the play and w when it was set well i, I think uh, so yes yeah, saul uh, saul uses not just foul language but um, repeatedly <laughs> offensive language and um, you're weirdly uh, good at and more than uh, <laughs> more than a you few racial it. slurs <laughs> and um, um, and at the same time i from from the very beginning uh, uh, first scene uh, with with Manford, um, I believe Saul is connecting his experience um, to manford's there there is a line, and I don't think it's a lie. Um, you know, I get it. I used to be just like you mm -hmm. right. you know a, a scrappy kid, and he keeps he keeps identifying. Uh, uh, points where he connects with Manford, not um, in in a uh, in the context of 
um, an Asian American experience. That's not Saul's experience, but his um, his ambition, his drive, um, and also, you know, there uh, one can um, one can infer a similar uh, a child of immigrants experience yeah. um, coming from the uh, Jewish coming from the Bronx in New York, uh, being uh, being a an under six foot tall uh, Jewish man playing basketball at at an almost professional level yeah. um, and not quite fitting in and ultimately injuring himself before he can uh, before he can move on and um, it, but Saul's will to succeed in this is something that he recognizes in Manford so all the um, uh, very differences between Saul and Manford's origin stories um, are sort of vitiated by the fact that there are these points where they come together. Yeah. And repeatedly, Saul looks for these, these ways that he can connect with Manford, not as the other, but until ultimately he's, he's referring to him as son. I was just going to say, there's a lot of father figure, fathery kind of yeah. thing, or themes going on, but I'm, I don't yeah. want to, again, I don't, I don't so, want to so say too much. So I think that there's a, um, uh, it, uh, um, I, I think that, I think that Saul's profanity, his racial slurs, his, his, um, that, that persona that he puts on, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's his, I think it's his armor and not his essence. Yeah, I don't uh, think it's yeah. his essence. Yeah, yeah. for sure. He, he starts out by saying, well, there's no way you can be any good because you're Chinese. I mean, he starts out shutting it down. That's right. And it really turns out he grows to respect Manford tremendously and understand the value that he plays on his Absol team. Absolutely. And that is an indication of someone who is not, you know, truly racist. <laughs> right, because he sees He's, he yeah. sees what he can do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And relates Within to it. Like yeah. the first five minutes of the play. That's too. right. Yeah. So, That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, language aside, if this show were done in China, mm. what do you think the reception would be, or what do you think they would be seeing in it? Very interesting question. Huh. It's hard to know, because we are, we're so American. We we can only yeah. surmise. Sure. Um, the the play does purport that. The um, the Chinese government um, is very <laughs> uh, dysfunctional about um, its own reputation and 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 you know re re reportage of certain events in, sure. in in Chinese history even are actually kind of altered or or and in, in, you know access to the internet all of those things we know about some of that but we don't really feel it as Americans I mean I I'm mindful of trying to say well, I really have no idea, but intellectually, I can imagine that um, the Chinese government would not like this play. I would imagine it's mm -hmm. it, 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 in my experience or in my knowledge, the Chinese government doesn't like a lot of things that <laughs> we do and say about that. You know, so we would they would shut down a lot of things. So I don't see it being done there in the same kind of way. It is what's kind of great about it is that Lauren Yi is an Am Asian American playwright mm -hmm. at a time when Asian American playwrights are really valuable in our country. And she's speaking the truth of, of what her point of view is as an Asian American. And she does say, uh, and she does make a very brief distinction in the play between being Asian American and Chinese in that when you're an Asian American going to China, or a Chinese American going to China, yeah. you don't necessarily feel like you're going home at all. Oh, it's There's weird. a sense of alienation that yeah. you actually feel. And that distinction is not necessarily fully understood by everyone, you know, um, by the, your average person. And I think that's an, a, a, a powerful distinction to show that her point of view as a playwright is very specific and not Chinese, but yeah. Chinese American. Yeah. I do uh, like to contemplate them translating it into Cantonese or Mandarin and just translating all of Saul's swear words. <laughs> yes, yes. That would be a, a good job for a Chinese censor. Well, it's well yes, and that happens in the play. It, yeah. You know, yeah. Really. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, 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 that scene is in the play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's beautifully written. Everything that BD just said, uh, you know, I think that that's, 
that's that's the essence of, of the play as well, is that this is a, a, a point of view and it's also experiences and, and it touches on so many different layers. Um, yeah. That's what I love about, about the play. It's time now, the, the best part of the program in which our audience gets to ask questions to our great stars. And so John here has a mic. <laughs> yeah. um, and you can ask. Eugene? Not anything. Yeah, was like, it, I was, don't say <laughs> no. Don't, say, don't, don't ask open what happens that can in the play. You can, can ask Beatty, Ari, or Tim your question. <laughs> Hi. Uh, question for Tim. Uh, yeah. Have you been to China? Because in the play, you had not experienced that. And uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, I have been to Taiwan, which, however, politically, th that's a whole nother mess <laughs> yeah. we can talk about. I've been to Taiwan. I still have, like, uh, uncles and cousins there. So I've never been to, like, mainland China, uh, which is a different beast, I guess, in terms of, you know, um, who they let in, who they don't let in, who, what they'll show you, stuff like that. Um, but I would like to eventually. I think that's, you know, see the Great Wall. <laughs> I guess. For, uh, BD, um, will we see you back on Law & Order SVU? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, that, was, that, that, that is a really, really good uh, uh, job that I had, and I'm so really extremely grateful for it, and it was a, a very specific time in my life. And um, uh, when I moved on from it, I moved on from it emotionally, I think, <clears throat> onto things that have satisfied me greatly and and I do I, I'm, I'm being facetious you know if they ask me to come back on and I they have in the last few seasons you know in a one-off kind of way to kind of retouch base with that particular character who is not dead you know hasn't been killed off or anything <laughs> um, I'm really happy 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 to do that I, I do love the people and everything there but um, the show itself really to be super honest was the same every week for me <laughs> and and was not that interesting I didn't feel a, a important to the show at all actually um, the, the, the driving of the plot of the show or the, the the circumstances that were happening I felt important to the other characters they needed me but I was in, I was kind of interchangeable, I felt, for, for any other kind of expert. Mm -hmm. And so that was, from an artistic standpoint, <laughs> not very, not the most stimulating thing for me. But from a, um, you know, my, I got that contract when my son was born, and I wanted <laughs> to stay in New York, and it was the most, the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. Super grateful to Dick Wolf and to those people for making that happen for me. So I stuck with it for 11 years, which is a long time, which is longer than any of the friends. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, Those residuals. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks. Thanks. Great. Do we have another question? Well, I have to tell you, when we lived in Manhattan, we saw you and Madam Butterfly. Hmm. And it was wonderful. Yeah. I don't tell you how many years ago it was. Well, it was 31 years no, yesterday. No, it was about 30 years the ago. The opening night yes. of Madam Butterfly. <laughs> wow. March 20th, 1988. And there were three young March women sitting in front of us, and they were so shocked when you became a man. <laughs> and <was laughs> you know, I didn't become a man. I always was a man. <laughs> but, but that's a story for another day. But that's a, um, <laughs> another idea. Uh, but you know, this life. is a very interesting anecdote that is very common, and I love this. It's, uh, it's, always, it's, not, it's never the person. It's always the person sitting behind someone. <laughs> that, that hears that someone sitting in front of them or behind them were aghast um, at the moment when it was at, when it was concretely revealed, <clears throat> and and that is a great satisfaction to me because uh, it was a very different time 31 years ago when it comes to talking about trans issues or trans people or or. Uh, or gender identity, gender identity. Yeah. and and so it was very there was a mystique about that play that because the play was quite obviously about this miscommunication this miss uh whatever you want to call it this the mystery of this creature this person and so it's there in the play for everyone to see from the very first scene and yeah. people were completely naive to it <laughs> until the third act when it was actually put almost literally in their face <laughs> and, and then they Rag. some people who came in from you know from not having read a lot about the play 
were completely aghast. That's always going to be one of the more satisfying things for me to hear about because they, they will, you'll hear, you, you know, you would, I was on the stage, really what I was basically doing is taking my makeup off in this ritualistic way on stage, right? And as the makeup's coming off and the clothes are coming off and I'm changing, you can hear people in the audience like, no way, <laughs> no way. And I, I just, there's nothing better than that as an actor. You never, that will never get better than that for me. Women were shocked because they were in the first row. Uh, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> oh my God, it's a man. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, we're going to see you all at the end of the month. <laughs> oh, great, great. 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 Yes, Come thank on you. Down. Mm. Sorry. My ticket to the play is on Sunday. And last night, I w as at another Commonwealth uh, event, one of the volunteers told me you might not be in the play this weekend. Not true. Yay! Yeah. Yay. <laughs> the one performance that I was not able to do was yesterday afternoon. Oh, good. And, and um, that was out of obligation, contractual obligation to the understudy who came in with the understanding that he would do it because I thought I had to go to New York to go do a, another job, which I didn't have to end up doing. Uh, on Sunday, the 24th, is it? I think? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Is going to be a boatload of people from a PG and any junior high school that I went to school oh. with. Oh, that'll yeah. be So good. it will either be a very good or a very bad performance. <laughs> <laughs> They're all good. Yeah. They're all good. Just, you know, too much thinking about it sometimes when there's too many people in the audience. My, my mother had 80 people in the audience on last Sunday. So that was that great, by the way. It was. Yeah, it was, that was yeah. a fun show. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, hi, we got to see the matinee yesterday, oh, and the sure. understudy did an excellent job. Yes, great, yeah. great. It is great. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask if you could imagine the kind of script and show where Asian Americans and Asians and anyone could play without caricature. Mm. Uh, I would, you know, without the gatekeepers saying, no, it has to be, you know, another way. And the two examples that I would set were uh, Frank's Place by Tim Reed. Uh, who's a well-known African-American. If you see him, you would recognize him. And uh, I think it did not make one season or a full season. It was called Frank's Place. Oh, a television show. Yeah, yeah. a TV uh -huh. show. And then the other one was James Edward Olmos, Edward James oh, Olmos. Yeah, Edward, Edward. His show was American Family, mm -hmm. right, which was set in the house of uh, a Chicano uh, yeah. Mexican-American family. So... The frustrations that Asian Americans <laughs> have had, right, is can you see a point getting past the gatekeepers where uh, a script uh, set in California, of all places, you know, could really um, hire enough actors who could uh, stretch, you know, could f uh, feel that they're playing uh, what they want to play? You know, I, I do think that we're in that. A, 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 we're creeping into a moment where Crest this is the happening. Hill. There are several television shows that are just becoming pilots now that are kind of built off of the success of Crazy Rich Asians. And when we talk about the success of Crazy Rich Asians, I'm always kind of like um, uh, nervous about kind of overhyping the fact that it's changed the world and all that. But the, the reality is that there are several kind of knockoffs yeah. of Crazy Rich Asians that are going to be on you know, it, it, the, the test will be whether the audience likes them or not, or whether they're actually good. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, they are, and some of my friends are in them, they're, they're really um, American families that are, a, that are a, either Chinese American or Asian American, and don't have caricature in, caricature in them. Um, and it depends on what you really mean by caricature. There's a, a kind of caricature that really makes me uncomfortable that I feel is, is, is becoming uh, antiquated. And I do think that uh, Asian American actors should be allowed to play broad comedy, and they should allow actually to be able to play broad comedy using dialect, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily in that way that kind of puts us down or, or makes us feel like we've gone back several years. I, I'm personally doing a new show on Comedy Central in the summer, which was a, also a pilot that they picked up, Comedy Central's a show uh, uh, starring Aquafina, and Aquafina is a create creature of her own kind of <laughs> unique. You know, she's not caricature, she's not stereotypical, she's broad though. And that show I don't see as having. And you know, it's a it's based off of her life. It's her um, 
her and her father in Queens, New York, Flushing, Queens. Yeah. So it's it's very, uh, you know, kind of madcap and, and silly, but it is also kind of real, too. Mm. So I'm encouraged by that and, and, and happy that we're kind of on the wave of that now and, and interested to see where it goes. Well, I mean, like, th for example, shows like Kim's Convenience yes. out of Canada, Canada it, he plays, they're both, everyone has neutral North American accents, yeah. but he plays someone that, like, uh, Paul Hyung Sun, it's Hyung Lee, I think, is his name. And he plays Appa, who's the, the dad, and he has this thick, like, Korean accent. And they play, it's very broad, but it's never character. I mean, for me, I would always say my favorite Asian American film in, a, like, that I've ever seen, I always say Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Uh -huh. And the reason being, it's just John Cho being a guy, and it's just Cal Penn being a guy that just, I just want to get high and eat White Castle. <laughs> and there's nothing, I mean, and it's, and in, we laugh and stuff, but like, and there's, there's Asian American films where we're like, oh, like even, um, uh, just, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but like, th there's a ton, and it's like, yeah, we're gonna talk about these issues, and, but mm -hmm. White Castle, they're just being guys. They're just being 20-year-old guys who have crappy jobs. They're almost kind of interchangeable with white guys. Or yeah, exactly. Guys and, any other, yeah. and that's kind of, I mean, that's but powerful. isn't that the goal? Yeah. Isn't well, that it, like it's the part of goal? the goal for sure. It's part of yeah. the goal to yeah. be able to do something like that could be a mediocre film. Yeah. You know how many mediocre films starring like a couple of white guys are out there? Like every <laughs> single one. Yeah. That's like the <laughs> definition. Yeah. No, Ari's in good movies. Ari's doing good stuff, man. But like, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like, there's this kind of idea. It's like, I just, I just want to, like I was saying before, like, I don't want to go to the gym and do sit-ups, man. I just want to be me. <laughs> I want to eat White Castle. <laughs> <laughs> Hang out. Like, and I think that's kind of, you know, right now, like we were talking to the pilots, there's like four or five pilots now yeah. that are like yeah. Jessica Gao's pilot. There, there's the Aquafina pilot. There's the one that the Ken Jong is doing. of something. Yeah, that Emperor Malibu. Malibu yeah. yeah, something. So there's, it's all happening. We're going to find out this fall, I guess, yeah. <laughs> if any of it sticks. And then Fresh Off the Boat's still out there, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Why are you shaking your head? Um, I think it relates to um, uh, Mr. Zipper's question about how would this play in China. Yeah. Is if you don't know your history mm -hmm. and how your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents got here in the first place. So the Transcontinental Railroad... Um, 150th comes up May 10th this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was followed by the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm -hmm. So unless we do a better job, K-12, to I think, yeah. teaching all of American history, and I credit the African Americans, they're doing a pretty good job. When I look at my grandson's uh, uh, textbooks in the fourth grade and the eighth grade, it's much more comprehensively taught. Uh, the institution of slavery and Jim Crow and all the um, consequences. So I think we need to combine both. You yeah. have to have education, then the entertainment can work, you know, in a more valid way, but not, but you can't be like, uh, a historical or, um, you know, like just White Castle hamburger. Yeah. You know, you've got to have some, which is actually how Lauren crafted this play. But I must say, I, you know, I'm friends with her father, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have totally different experiences uh, with our families in China. Because my father could not go to the Yi Association because he did not agree on the pro-Taiwan uh, oh, position. Interesting. Yeah, so y there are certain things that uh, unless you get them from the previous generations, right. Americans suffer, I think, from this. Uh, I mean, what isn't an American mm -hmm. that you can name White Castle? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I actually think, I mean, you know, when we're talking about diversity now, today, uh, diversity in Hollywood, diversity in the workplace, I mean, diversity isn't just also the representation or the face. I mean, we, you know, when you talk to Dustin Lance Black, who just did, or a few years ago, did ABC's mini reality series and telling um, Cleve Jones's story, it's like the response there was, well, you didn't talk about me. You didn't, you, you know, you didn't talk about this. You didn't have enough trans identity or you, and, and then his response to that was, it's, it's really impossible to tell all the stories. And what we have to do is continue to tell the stories, write more stories. If you're a writer, you got to start writing. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, um, an actor, get out there and try to get the roles. Like it's, it's really not just up to the 
the yeah. actors themselves to represent the storylines. Yeah, we have yeah. we have to tell the stories too. And so you know, even one of the questions that I asked earlier is like talking about uh, 1969 to 1985 China w uh, to Chinese Americans. Sometimes we forget that there's sensitivity around the politics around that too. Yeah. Um, but not to say that this play had to have all the answers for everything that was going on right. in China at that time. Well, is the burden of education, so it, it comes down to kind of the idea of burden of education. Mm -hmm. It's, um, so like something that a lot of black friends would be, say like, these people keep coming at me on Twitter, telling me, well then, oh, why not? It's like, it's not my job to educate you for this. You, you sh it's like, look it up in that sense. You know, there, there's like, um, uh, how would I say this? It's, um, yeah, you can't touch on everything. And you, you, yeah, it's you, not your job to all the time. And I it think it's important too. And I think there's space for all of it. You know, there's, that's why there's, uh, there's a historical film and there's a comedy film and there's this and there's this and there's this. And having, it's like, the, it's like we were talking before about gatekeepers, like give us the option to have these. It can't just be like, look, Kung Fu was a huge part of Chinese culture. But every movie that has Chinese people is like a kung fu movie, right? <laughs> so again, it's like this idea of not only writers and, and things like that, but like the gatekeepers, the actual producers, mm. the companies. And what's going to happen, I mean, what's kind of happening, and I don't know if anyone follows it, but in the films and things, it's like, oh, China's a huge market. So why don't we make all these films with giant sharks or with robots and whatever, and we don't have to worry about the, the writing of it, and we'll stick a couple of Asian faces in it good mm. and it's like well that's not that's not good you know and it's like getting those gatekeepers getting the education getting the the, the right teachers like getting the right textbooks like california i guess you guys might be luckier but like your friends from like kentucky and like like i mean kentucky especially it's like you read some of these things, it's like, that's what you learned? It's like, yeah, that's why I moved to New York, dude. It's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> we have well, time for one more question yes, from sorry. the audience. Hey, right back here. Hi. Hello. So Hello. my question is, why do you think now, now is the time that the Asian American culture is finally being seen by all Americans? They tried once before in the 90s. We all remember Margaret Cho's show, American Girl, which was awesome yeah. and, and quickly canceled. It's <laughs> just we weren't ready then or what has happened and changed in the past 20 years that all of a sudden now it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, hmm. Ari? Yeah, Ari, Ari speak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ari, speak for all white Americans. I, 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 I really don't know that I have any coherent <laughs> analysis of of why this moment has has happened, um, but um, I think success is a big success, part of the it. money. I mean, Absolutely, Margaret's show was not <laughs> successful, and Margaret's show could have been better, to be quite honest, and and um, was fraught with with kind of um, creative problems that came from the point of view, the Asian point of view, being getting really lost. And I do feel that Aquafina's situation, and 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 also even fresh of the, uh, off the boat, there is more of a point of view, an Asian point of view in those shows that Mar than Margaret had, and and so that's changed. And the, again, it, not to overstate the success of Crazy Rich Asians, but that success is what speaks to the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is then going to program or to um, make decisions based upon the success, phenomenal success of that movie and rip it off, really. Try to mine <laughs> what was, what was yeah. good about that. And it, and it is true that it's, um, it, it come, some kind of comes down to a commercial sensibility, but it's also logical, you know? It is what the people want. Mm -hmm. It is what the people seem to be speaking to say that they want, and so then you give them more of it. So what Asian America could use to do is to speak up about what it really wants and demand what it wants. And there's always been a kind of difficulty in that. Um, it's either a cultural thing or it's, it's something, but millennial Asians are much more uh, active in getting what they want, <laughs> to be quite honest, um, to a fault really. And, and, <laughs> and uh, I'm, you know, I have an 18 year old son, so I'm, I'm you know, in the throes of getting what he wants. Um, <laughs> 
Well, uh, I mean, it's also like the entire cult, not just if, if we separate entertainment with everything else, I, I don't think we can do that. We have to kind of combine it, like the emergence of the internet and all of a sudden all these, the first things like early internet was all these kind of Chinese or mm. Asian Americans doing these dumb videos and Asian Americans. And it was uh, Asian it was Americans. Asian American they, landscape. They wanted it was it. totally yeah. dominated by Asian Americans. And still, it's still it's, kind it's of very is. dominated by Asian Americans. And it's something... Very interesting about that because it doesn't have the same because it's directly it's a direct to the people to the people and it and it doesn't have the same gatekeeper issue so yeah. quality is able to um, to kind of emerge right. in a way it's you know and up. dance troops and that, dance that, that, that dance that blows my mind I love food. that. Like the best Ooh, break yeah. dancers, like it's like a yeah. bunch of like Chinese kids from like you know Orange LA, County, Orange County, yeah. and then like food. All of a sudden, there's this like, oh, we need to find more authentic stuff, authentic food. Yeah. And then once everyone's more comfortable with like, oh, what's that weird thing that yeah. I used to think was super weird when I was growing up? And people were like, oh, you brought that for lunch? Like yes, right. Like the whole hashtag lunchbox moment thing, and all of a sudden, people in, in America are more comfortable. Like, oh, I. I Oh, what's that noodle it. called? Oh, it's pho. Yeah. Oh, it's ramen. Oh, yeah. that's like uh, the nyoromian. It's like this like beef noodle soup, stuff like that. That's, that, that is very true. That yeah. is a very when, that comfortable paradigm with that, shift of That means I'm comfortable with you. Yes. Which means I'm comfortable with seeing you. And then guys, and then all of a sudden, Jeremy Lin pops up. Oh, Asian guy can play ball. All right. So let's look at the, so right now, college players, there's a couple of Chinese, uh, Chinese, Chinese American, Japanese guys that are playing like in the G League or a D1 ball. So it's like, I'm a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more yeah. comfortable. And then internet starts and it's like, oh, I'm seeing more and more of like these kids doing pranks or whatever yeah. it is. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, we want to watch a movie with these guys. And then there, there was this movie and it's like, all right, let's see what else we can do. Ah. Yeah. I well, <laughs> and, I, and I would add also that the country has demographically changed since yeah. 1990, 1995 or such. It's, I mean, this is the oldest story in the world. It's continued to get more and more diverse. Yeah. You're living near more people who are eating mm -hmm. different foods, yeah. who are the primary thing you're likely, unless you're just a, a in born racist, the <laughs> thing you're most likely going to be concerned about your neighbors are they throwing their leaves over your, your fence? <laughs> or, you know, or do, do they let their kids run around and oh my god, are they not vaccinated? <laughs> <laughs> well, the internet. Yeah. We're coming to an end to the program, yes. and then what I'm hearing is I got to come, I got to come out again. I got to go back into all the years that, that didn't have internet and all the weird things that I like. <laughs> I got to come out again and be like. I had I ate wet, white rabbit candy when I was a kid. Oh yeah, I'm cool. Yeah. Hashtag yeah. that. You puck all. Yeah. No, no like all uh, stuff, man. Thank you, thank you all for being here with us this afternoon, and thank you to our amazing, amazing guests today. And yeah. Oh. If you haven't had a chance to go see The Great Leap, it's running now. It runs until March 31st, I believe, at the ACT Geary Street Theater, so you can get your tickets. And if you want a special Commonwealth Club member promo code, you can see John. <laughs> He's got the special promo code. Um, I can't uh, thank you, Sarah Monty Ford, for lunch again. And the Sarah Monty Ford. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah Jess. And don't forget, the Michelle Miao Show is here every Thursday afternoon, and we tape our podcast here. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Right. Thanks, right, guys.